Hi guys, I just wanted to go through and I just wanted kind of to um, discuss some of the stuff to do with the endocrine system. Um, since nobody is zooming, I don't have any other forum to be able to kind of discuss things with you. Um, I know that the outline notes that I gave you and the PowerPoint are pretty thorough, um, but I would still like to, to just go over some of this stuff just to make sure you get a little bit of an understanding. We're not going to spend an extreme amount of time on this just simply because um, our seniors are done on the 14th and we need to be able to take our test on this uh, chapter by that date. Um, but I do want to just go through and, and give you some highlights. Okay, so um, obviously this chapter is on the endocrine system. Just again to kind of differentiate the endocrine system from the exocrine system. Exocrine system is the one where there's the secretions from the exocrine glands go into little ducts and usually those exit the body. So that's like our sebaceous glands, our sweat glands, mammary glands, ceruminous glands, um, things like that. The endocrine system, on the other hand, this is where the secretions go directly into the bloodstream, okay? Um, and that, of course, is primarily our chemical mes messengers that we call our hormones, okay? So we're going to learn about a lot of the different organs um, that create these hormones, um, what some of the hormones are, what they do, that sort of thing. I'm not going to go through all the hormones today. Um, we'll spend some more time with that next week, but I just want to kind of give you some highlights of things that um, we're talking about in this chapter. Okay, one of the first chemical um, signals uh, that uh, this chapter touches on, if you're looking at the PowerPoint, um, is something called pheromones. And typically we think of pheromones the most with insects or with uh, um, animal species. Okay, and um, for example, with insects, one of the things that the pheromones do is often males will release this pheromone, which is like this chemical scent um, that will attract the females. Okay, it's just something that uh, is going to attract the females to their um, geographical area so they can breed. But even people produce pheromones, uh, believe it or not. Now, it's not pheromones to attract our mate, but for example, there's a pheromone that women release that when you have a lot of women that live in the um, same household, uh, their menstrual cycles will actually sync up together because of that chemical that they're, that pheromone that their body is um, releasing. So these are just a type of chemical um, signal that uh, kind of influences the behavior of other organisms. That's what pheromones are. Okay, then we get into the actual hormones. Now, there are two types of hormones that this chapter touches on. There are protein or amino acid um, derivative um, hormones that we call peptide hormones. And there are lipid-based or lipid derivative hormones that we call steroid hormones. Now, peptide hormones are different from the steroid hormones, not only in their derivative or their derivation, uh, but also in how they act. Peptide hormones, because they're protein-based, they cannot travel easily through the plasma membrane. So typically what they're going to do is they're going to look for target cells that have certain receptors on that plasma membrane. So if this is my cell, they're going to stick to that plasma membrane on the outside. Okay, that's the way a peptide hormone works. It's going to look for the proper receptors. It's going to stick to that plasma membrane, um, and then it will kind of activate like a second messenger. Okay, the steroid hormones, because they are nonpolar, like the phospholipids in the plasma membrane, they can actually travel into the cell um, and not only uh, move around inside the cell, but they can even go all the way into the nucleus. Okay, so that's the biggest difference. Peptide hormones only stay on the outside, whereas the steroid hormones can actually travel into the cell because they're nonpolar and they can get through that plasma membrane um, easily. Okay, um, then the notes goes in and it starts talking about um, the different um, structures involved within the endocrine system. Um, and the first one, and it doesn't give you a whole lot of details about this, and, and really we're not going to go into a whole lot either, um, but it's a structure called the hypothalamus, okay? Um, and the uh, hypothalamus is really the direct link between our endocrine system and our nervous system. And the hypothalamus kind of regulates a lot of the stuff going on in the endocrine system. Um, for those of you, for example, that are in AP Psych and you've talked about the endocrine system before, 
You know that the pituitary gland is often called the master gland because it produces a lot of hormones that if they don't do what they're supposed to, um, our body can get really out of whack. We're not going to grow and develop properly. And for that reason, the pituitary is often called the master gland. Well, the hypothalamus, um, this is the structure that actually controls that pituitary gland. Okay, it's the one that um, uh, is going to be in charge of uh, both lobes of the pituitary gland. So it's considered our direct connection once again through the nervous system or between the nervous system and our endocrine system. Okay, pituitary gland. Um, Dr. Anderson did a really good job in the video that I made you watch last week where he drew out the pituitary gland, little tiny thing up in near our brain there. Um, it's got double lobes. There's the anterior pituitary and the posterior, and it makes sense. Anterior is the front lobe. The posterior is the back lobe. Um, and it just tells you some of the things that it does. Now, posterior pituitary. We'll, again, we'll get into more of these specific hormones later on. Um, more next week. I just want to kind of touch on them a little bit. Um, posterior pituitary is known to produce the antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH. Now, think about what that means. This is where it's important. Remember, we've been talking since the beginning of the year about the importance of root words and prefixes. Anti means against, diuretic. Diuretic is something that makes you, um, basically caffeine is a diuretic. It's something that's going to make you eliminate fluids. Okay, so an antidiuretic is going to do the opposite. It's going to um, basically um, encourage your kidneys to um, keep your fluids in. It doesn't want to excrete them. Okay, and so ADH is one that is controlled by the um, posterior pituitary. Another uh, one that um, is important, especially in women, um, uh, produced by the posterior pituitary is oxytocin. Oxytocin is um, actually one of the hormones that when a woman is in active labor, when she's pregnant, um, it's the one that's going to make those um, contractions get progressively worse at the, at the time of um, delivery. So remember what happens is this is a positive feedback loop. The contractions get more and more intense until either the baby's born or they got to do a C-section or something because it's reached that, that um, climactic point. Okay, um, the uh, antidiuretic hormone, it actually works using a negative feedback loop, which we'll talk a little bit more later on. Um, and then, of course, the oxytocin is a positive feedback loop. Okay, then we have the um, anterior uh, pituitary. Um, and it has a lot to do with um, encouraging um, the thyroid and what it's supposed to do. Um, and it also produces some of the other hormones like the uh, adrenocorticotropic uh, hormone. Um, it is the one that stimulates the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Okay, we'll talk more about that. And the gonadotropic hormones. Now, the gonadotropic hormones are the ones that are going to stimulate the gonads, uh, which in women are the ovaries and males are the testes, to produce their hormones. So um, the anterior pituitary actually encourages the gonads, again, ovaries and testes, to produce the estrogen in women and the testosterone in uh, the males. And then there's some other ones like melanocyte stimulating hormone. We know that melanocytes, remember, are um, the ones that help uh, with our skin pigmentation, our hair pigmentation, things like that, um, as well as the growth hormone. Now, we've talked a lot about growth hormone um, in the past, okay? Remember, if somebody receives too much, if the pituitary is producing too much growth hormone before puberty, that can result in gigantism. Um, and again, in Dr. Anderson's video, he talked uh, about Robert Wadlow, who um, he was almost nine feet tall, just shy of nine feet tall, but he died fairly early on because what happened was circulation issues. He was so tall that it was hard for um, blood and gases exchange and nutrient exchange and all that to occur efficiently because of his excessive size. So gigantism is there's too much growth hormone before puberty. And then we had also touched on um, acromegaly, which is where there was too much growth hormone after puberty. And that's where the person, they looked normal in their early uh, childhood years, even on to early adulthood. But then what happens is you start to get a broadening of the bridge of the nose, the hands start to get bigger, the feet start to get bigger, um, things like that. Uh, um, and that's uh, because of too much growth hormone after puberty. 
Okay, um, thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located um, uh, just above your larynx there, or just below the larynx there, um, and it is primarily uh, it involves a lot of different um, hormones. Obviously, the one that controls our metabolism. Um, it is the one that also produces T3 and T4, which just stands for the different amount of iodine atoms. Um, remember, there are a couple things that can happen if we don't get enough iodine. One of the most um, uh, common things that happens in a person whose diet is lacking iodine, they're not getting enough or their body's not producing enough, is something called simple goiter. And what will happen is they can get a lump on the side of the neck. It can be small or it can get really big um, if they're really lacking iodine. And the good news is um, the treatment for that is simply to uh, make sure that the person gets iodine put back in their diet. And usually over time, um, the goiter will go away. This is one of the reasons why in the United States, why the salt that we sell is iodized um, to make sure that that um, doesn't happen. Um, there's also um, something called congenital hypothyroidism. Now, hypothyroidism means that the thyroid is not producing what it should. Um, and when it's congenital, it means that the child is born with it. Um, and it's usually the, the child does not live very long. It's also known as cretinism. Um, and they're just not getting enough of all the different hormones that they need to develop properly. Um, usually a high level of... Um, uh, mental retardation and other physical issues and so the baby doesn't usually survive very long. Um, hypothyroidism in adults is called myxedema. Um, if they can get on medication uh, it's something that's relatively easy to regulate but if they don't it can cause lots of other issues and can cause death eventually too. Um, and then we also have hyperthyroidism which is also known as Graves disease. And one of the signs that a person might be suffering of that is when they get those big bulging eyes. It shows you some pictures there in the PowerPoint. Um, that's called exophthalmic goiter. Okay, so remember there was simple goiter with the iodine with the thyroid here. Exophthalmic goiter, that's Graves' disease. That means their, their thyroid is producing too much. It's doing too much what it should. And another thing that you'll notice with people with Graves' disease is um, they'll also um, be really skinny. They're one of those who can eat whatever they want. Um, I never seem to gain any weight, and that's because they have the hyperthyroidism. Um, no comments, Josh and Logan. I don't want to hear it. Okay, um, parathyroid. On the sides of the thyroid, there's these little butterfly-shaped um, gland called the parathyroid gland, and we've talked about the PTH, the parathyroid um, hormone, before. Uh, remember, it kind of works antagonistically with the uh, the um, calcitonin. Um, PTH is produced when the blood calcium levels are low, okay, and it's going to do things that it's going to stimulate our body to um, release calcium. So it's going to cause the osteoclast to start working and release um, calcium stored in our bones into our blood because the blood calcium level is too low. Okay, and there's also the calcitonin, then remember that comes from the thyroid, that's the opposite. Um, if our blood calcium levels get too high, it does things to kind of absorb some of that calcium. So it's going to stimulate osteoblast instead of osteoclast. We talked about that back in chapter 6 when um, we were studying osseous um, tissue. Okay, then we have the adrenal glands. Okay, so you have your two kidneys, take your two hands, make a fist, kind of put them behind your back like you were hiding them. Um, and then uh, that's where your kidneys sit. And on top of those are uh, a major uh, gland in our endocrine system called the adrenal glands. Okay, and there's two parts. There's an outer part of the adrenal gland. Think back to when we dissected the kidney. You should remember these terms. Outer part is called the cortex. And the inner part is called um, the medulla, okay? The outer part, um, the cortex, is known to produce epinephrine, uh, norepinephrine. So, you know, when we talk about adrenaline, that's what we're talking about there, okay? Um, and then the um, adrenal cortex also... Uh, um, I just did that backwards, I guess. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Trying to... Stay in line with the notes and do you too. Uh, the epinephrine and the norepinephrine are from the medulla. That's the inner part of the adrenal gland. I apologize, not the outer part. Um, so the inner part of the adrenal glands is called the medulla. That's the one that produces the adrenaline. That's our flight or our um, 
uh, flight or fight response. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of that before where when you're scared, you're either going to stay and fight or you're going to run away. It's the adrenaline that makes us do that. So that's the adrenal medulla that produces that. Okay, um, the adrenal cortex, which is the outside part, that produces the glucocorticoids and the mineral uh, corticoids. Um, one of the glucocorticoids is called cortisol. Um, and you'll see this in a lot of different uh, things. Um, and what cortisol does is it breaks, uh, it, it promotes the breakdown of muscle protein into amino acids, okay? It breaks down fatty acids um, rather than um, carbohydrates. Um, so it's gonna raise our blood glucose levels. That's what cortisol's, uh, cortisol's job is. Okay, the mineral corticoids, these are things that are gonna help us get the different minerals that we need. Um, aldosterone being one of those and we're going to talk about um, the aldosterone and uh, region angiotensin um, system later when we get more into some of the review sheets and stuff I'm not going to touch on that too much uh, now okay but again uh, inner adrenal glands the medulla that's the ones for the epinephrine the norepinephrine or adrenaline okay and then the outer cord uh, cortex that's what produces the glucocorticoids which includes cortisol Okay, um, cortisol is going to raise our blood, close, uh, blood glucose levels. Um, and then the mineral corticoids, um, one of which is the aldosterone, which again, we'll talk about at a, a later time. Okay, pancreas. Pancreas is another important organ in our endocrine system. Two major things that our pancreas is known to produce, insulin and glucagon, okay? And these work antagonistically to each other. Insulin is secreted when our blood sugar glucose levels are high. Its job is to break down the sugar. So what happens to somebody when they have diabetes mellitus, okay, it means that their body, either their pancreas is not producing insulin, that's the type one diabetes where they have to have insulin injections, or when people tend to get um, older, um, or usually after age 35, they can develop what's called type 2 diabetes. And what happens there is the pancreas produces insulin, but the cells don't respond to it. It's like they're not producing it. And so they have to take a medication that's going to change the receptors to make their body respond to the um, insulin. Um, and this happens if people, once they get past a certain age, if they continue to have a high intake of sugar and eat a really poor diet and don't get a lot of exercise, they can get this type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, you do not need insulin injections because your body's producing insulin. Your cells just aren't re receiving it and responding to it. So you have to take a medication that allows it to do that, but it, it's not usually in an injectable form. Okay, so insulin's job again is when we have, uh, when we've just eaten and we need to break down our food, um, that's what the insulin does. That's its job. That's one of the things produced by um, the pancreas. Another um, uh, hormone that's produced by the pancreas is called glucagon, and it's the opposite. Instead of um, like producing the insulin to break down, you know, help us break down our food, get rid of that um, sugar, okay, the glucagon is produced when our blood glucose levels are very, very low, okay? So this is gonna be like in between uh, meals. Um, and the liver and the adipose tissue are gonna be the main um, targets. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna break down fat and other things that can kind of help us get through that lull of not having the food that we need um, to get the energy that our body needs. So insulin, right after we've eaten, um, when the blood glucose levels are high, we wanna break down that sugar, we wanna get rid of it. When the blood glucose levels are low in between meals, the pancreas produces the um, glucagon. And again, diabetes, diabetes mellitus, two types. Type one is the one that you can be born with where your pancreas does not produce insulin or it produces an insufficient amount of insulin. And then type two is what you develop later on in life. Usually that's in people who have high sugar, high caloric diet, very little exercise. Um, and their body produces insulin, but their cells don't respond to it. So they have to take a medication to, to make them do that um, usually. Okay, um, the go, gonads, again, in females, we have the ovaries. Um, in males, we have the testes. They produce the um, sex hormones that give us our secondary sexual characteristics. Estrogen, 
um, is produced by the ovaries, testosterone is produced um, by the testes, um, and they result, like I said, in those secondary um, sexual characteristics. There's a few other um, hormones, again, that we'll touch on at a, a later time. Um, thing to touch on for the males, a lot of times we know um, males when they're working out they want to get the really big huge muscles. Even some women today are doing that too and they take something called anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids are not natural, they are synthetic, okay, and what they're doing is they're supposed to stimulate their bo your body to build muscle mass, which they do, but unfortunately there's a lot of bad side effects, okay, it can make you have these moments of rage where you would do things that you typically wouldn't do, um, it's not good physiologically for your body, um, and so it's something that even if you want to be a big uh, awesome bodybuilder, you should not put into your body, and they are in fact illegal for that reason. Okay, but they're mimicking the natural testosterone that's going to help you build the muscle mass and get bigger. Um, but because they're synthetic, it's like putting poison into the body and it's not a good thing. Um, pineal gland. Pineal gland is another one that's located up in the brain. Um, and the pineal gland produces melatonin. Melatonin is what gives us our circadian rhythm. So um, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm on the same schedule now since we've had this lull in our normal routine. But you know, normally during the school year, I don't have to use an alarm clock. I wake up automatically like at 4 or 4.30. That's the typical time that I get up and, and start going and doing the things that I have to do. Um, and that's because the melatonin, you know, my eyes have been closed long enough. I know that that's the time that I need to wake up. I don't need an alarm clock um, to do that. It's the melatonin that helps us with that. Um, it can be reversed for some people. For example, those uh, doctors and nurses and um, police officers and people that do shift work, um, they might have the exact opposite, okay? But the melatonin um, kind of reacts to when, when we sleep and what hours we sleep. Um, so it's going to set our circadian rhythm, and that's because of the melatonin produced um, by the pineal gland in the, uh, in the brain. Thymus gland. The thymus gland is found to be active uh, primarily in our early childhood years. Okay, and it usually sits above the, the heart. Um, it often looks like a big uh, fatty tissue in a young child. It's not really fat though, it's very important. The thymus gland is what's going to produce the lymphocytes and those help us with immune response. Um, so the reason that it gets smaller and it kind of shrinks away as we get older is because we build up immunity. We have those antibodies already inside of us and so we don't need it to be as active as what it is in the beginning. Okay, so that's uh, the, the purpose for the, um, the thymus gland. Um, now, not all um, hormones uh, are produced by different um, structures. Um, there are the uh, prostaglandins, and they are actually produced by different types of cells. They don't have like a separate organ like most of the other um, hormones that we've talked about in the um, endocrine system. Um, and they have many different functions. They can cause uh, contraction of the uterine muscle. Um, they can mediate the effects of pyrogens, uh, which is uh, believed to be like what regulates our body temperature, helps us feel you know, either hot or cold. Um, they have to do with our gastric secretions from our small intestine and our stomach. Um, and they also have to do with uh, regulating blood pressure and stuff like that. Um, there's an, another peptide uh, hormone that's produced in the kidneys called EPO, uh, erythropoietin, okay, and it's actually going to stimulate the production of red blood cells. That's where the prefix comes from. Remember, erythro means red. So it's produced in the kidneys and it stimulates the production of red blood cells. And then leptin, this is a hormone that's actually produced by the fat tissue, the adipose tissue, and it's one that kind of regulates our... Um, our eating habits, our appetite, what makes us hungry or not hungry. So when people are taking um, diet pills, what it does is it suppresses that leptin, it, it inhibits them, okay? Um, you'll see mentioned in the notes, and we'll again, we'll talk more about this later, there are in, um, stimulating hormones and inhibiting hormones. Stimulating hormones are going to enhance something, make something happen better, um, and inhibiting hormones are the ones that are gonna slow something down or stop it. Okay, and we have some of both that do different things in our body, and, and we'll talk about those more later. Okay, so that's a little introduction 
Um, very kind of surface level right now. We'll get more into that as we go through um, more examining these notes in this PowerPoint. And we're going to watch some other videos and do some other fun things next week as well. Um, so I hope you guys have a great weekend. I'm sorry this is so late in the day. Um, just not enough hours in the day lately with this remote learning. I love and miss you all. Please try and Zoom when you can. It's a great opportunity for us to review and go over stuff, especially like on quiz days and stuff like that. Um, I can do a little oral quiz for you like I used to do in class. That really seems to help your comprehension. And if you guys are being honest, like I know you are all the little honest angels that you are, you're not supposed to be using notes and stuff on your quizzes. So um, a good review during Zoom would be a good thing for you. So have a great weekend. Take care. I love and miss you all. And uh, I hope you'll Zoom with me next week so I can kind of check in and see how everybody's doing. Bye.